morning. Welcome to our Tuesday Bible study this morning. And just let me remind you that if you have any prayer requests, uh, please send those on to Rosalind, and she will put those on our prayer list and send out an email with those. Uh, do keep our country in your prayers. A lot of things are going on right now that uh, are really destroying our countries and our country. And I don't know where you stand. I have a lot of black friends who are very good people. I have a lot of police friends who are very good people. And uh, I feel for both of these, and I don't think either should be subjected to, uh, to some kind of uh, looking down upon just because of some bad people that may be in, in their part. There's bad people everywhere and, uh, in society, and there's bad white people, bad black people, bad Asian people, bad, bad policemen, bad school teachers. I mean, there are bad people out there, but they are in the majority. Yeah, a minority, excuse me, and uh, just keep that in mind. Let's pray for our country at this time. Dear me, Father, I do thank you so much for this day and for the blessings that we have, the goodness that you have given to us, an opportunity, Father, for, for, to live in this country and to take advantage of all the opportunities that are given to us here. But I know, Father, right now we are in crisis, and I pray that uh, you would be with the, the situations there bring reason and logic to people's minds and also father again as it's been said this is a heart problem and uh, we need to change people's hearts as Stan talked about Sunday we need not to be uh, just indifferent about things we really need to get impassioned about uh, what's going on in our lives in our country and impassioned about telling people about you, that our only hope is in Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, right now that you would uh, you'd be with those that are sick, and I pray, Father, that you would give them your healing. And be with us as we study your word today. And I pray, Father, we might uh, be able to uh, be able to find things here that will be helpful to us in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we start uh, with the dookie joke. There's a dookie, a wahoo, and a tar heel, and they show up for the same interview, job interview. And the wahoo's the first one to go in, in fact, filling out the forms, going through the question. The interviewer decides to ask one more question. And the question is this, how many D's are there in Indiana Jones? The wahoo thinks for just a second, responds one. The interviewer sends her back with a promise that he'll get back to her after interviewing the remaining candidates. The Tar Heel is next. The process goes about the same. And at the end, he asks her, how many D's are there in Indiana Jones? And she immediately says, one. And the interview says, okay, I will let you know when we're done with the interviews. Then the Dookie comes into the room, goes through the same questions, finally gets asked that same question. How many D's are there in Indiana Jones? She gets a very serious look on her face, you know, uh, starts counting on her finger, fingers, my two, four, six, mm, wait, two, four, six. Can I borrow your calculator, please? And after going through 15 minutes of intense calculating, she finally comes up with the answer. 32. And if you stunts and ask her, okay, now tell me, how in the world did you come up with this answer of 32? Well, she said it, was, it wasn't really that hard. Uh, it took a little time, but you know, D, 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 D. I won't go through all 32 of them. But listen, I have a confession to make this morning. Now that perked up your ears, didn't it? Yeah, we hear someone's going to make a confession with a juicy details. So now that I have your attention, I, I should tell you that I don't mean a confession in the series of an admission of guilt. Although, I probably should make several of those. What I'm talking about, th though, is a confession in the sense of a formal statement of essential doctrinal truth. Okay, now I've lost all of you, but, but I promise you. This is interesting, so stay with me. Most people today, I know, don't want to hear about doctrine. 
They want feel-good messages. And I understand that. I would rather leave you feel with a message that makes you feel good uh, rather than like you've been whipped into submission. But this is not whipping you into submission. I just want you to understand this is very important. But I, I hope that, that you know, it's, it, uh, that you know that it used to be used by most Christians within the Protestant tradition, and they were well taught in the great confession of faith. There have been many great confessions of faith, by the way. If you were raised a Dutch Calvinist, uh, with a Dutch Calvinist background, for example, you have been, would have been taught the Heidelberg Confession. If you were a Presbyterian background, you would have learned the Westminster Confession of Faith. Many congregations learned the Savoy uh, Declaration of Faith and Order. And many Baptists learned the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. And of course, for many centuries, Christians all around the world have recited the Apostles' Creed. Uh, but this morning, I want to look at the greatest confession of them all. And it happened it to be a very short one. I think probably most of you probably memorized it already. But short as it is, it's already a remarkable one. And it is the only confession that had the direct endorsement of God's own blessing and placed upon it immediately after it was first uttered. This confession is the confession which all other confessions absolutely must be based. It, in fact, I go so far to say as it is the one confession above all others that is essential to believe in order to be saved. Now this blessed confession, great confession, was first uttered by the Apostle Peter is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. It's there that we read, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And uh, who, who do you say the Son of Man is? Okay. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. What, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now in this passage, we have one of those rare occasions, and one of only two in the New Testament, in which our Savior spoke during his earthly ministry of the church that he promised to build. The church that he shed his own blood to redeem is obviously a subject that is near and dear to his heart. And this is one of the most crucial passages, I believe, in the Gospel of Matthew. It is a passage to, to which so much of this, of this Gospel has been leading us to. It's truly one of the great passages in the Bible. There are vital truths revealed to us by our Lord, in it, and we dare not rush through it. Now, this confession was first uttered uh, at an important juncture in Jesus' earthly ministry. He had been receiving increasing opposition from the religious leaders of the day. Most recently, you remember, they came to him along the shores of the Sea of Galilee and tested him, demanding that he give them a sign from heaven. And Jesus had been performing many signs that were more, uh, more than sufficient, I think, uh, for anyone who truly wanted to know the truth about him. But, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not satisfied. They wanted to set the terms and have him prove himself in accordance with their demands, you know, even though they were clearly not interested in believing him at all. Jesus, of course, refused to do that. Uh, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees demanded, he told them that the only sign they would receive from him is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Uh, back in verse 4 of this chapter, that sign, he says, that just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he gathered his disciples into a boat. Together they departed to the other side of the sea. Now, 
I believe that Jesus was wanting to get his disciples away from all this opposition for a while. Once the boat reached the shore, they traveled about 20 to 25 miles, kind of northeast, came to Caesarea Philippi. It's a city that rested near the gentle slopes of Mount Hermon, and it would have given him and his disciples a beautiful place to retreat from the fights and the pressures that they had been experiencing. It would have given his disciples a time to relax and reflect on the things that they had been learning from him. And it would also have given Jesus the chance to solidify in them the great essential truth about himself that they needed to know before he led them to Jerusalem and to the place of his crucifixion. In Mark's gospel, we're told that this conversation took place on the road in Mark 8, 27. Luke tells us that it happened when Jesus had been alone in prayer and when the disciples came to him and joined him in Luke 9, 18. And so we can imagine, I think, that as they journeyed on their way to this place of rest, they stopped, had a time of quiet and prayer along the roadside. And it's my belief that the great teacher was praying for his beloved students during that time. He was about to give them a sort of final exam, and he wanted them very much to pass it. And they did pass the test, and as a result, we have this great confession preserved for our edification today. Now, at this point, Jesus had been with the disciples for about two and a half years. And they've heard his teaching, they've seen his work with hundreds and hundreds of miracles. And now, alone with them, he asked them this question. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Now, it's interesting, at least to me, <clears throat> that Jesus was compared to these three men. Many people believe that Jesus was one of these great men, reincarnated or, or risen from the dead. And it, his preaching was very similar to the preaching of these great prophets. As John MacArthur says, some saw in Jesus something of the character and message of J John the Baptist. Some saw in him the fire and intensity of Elijah. And still others saw in him the lament and grief of Jeremiah. And, and, and people be who believed Jesus might be one of those great prophets were really paying him a great compliment and setting him really in a high place, but not high enough. He was more than a prophet. Jesus, of course, didn't ask this to the disciples because he lacked information about what people were saying about him. He knew very well what people were saying about him. Rather, he asked this as his disciples in, or, or, in order to encourage them to think. And that's always a great question to ask people, by the way. Who do you say that Jesus is? What is your opinion of Jesus? It's a question, I think, that reveals much about the person. It sets him or her to thinking uh, uh, of the greatest theme of, theme of all here. And clearly, the disciples were aware of the popular opinions about Jesus. For example, they knew some folks thought that he was John the Baptist. We've already encountered that opinion, the person, person of Herod the Great, the one who had John murdered. Perhaps Herod thought this because Jesus had preached the same unwelcome message that John the Baptist had been preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or maybe it was because John preached, or Jesus preached with the same sort of fiery boldness that characterized John. But whatever reason, Herod had heard the reports about Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. And apparently this false concept of Jesus had spread from Herod, uh, Herod's paranoia to popular opinion. But there were other people, the disciples said, who thought that Jesus was Elijah, the great prophet uh, who was taken up into heaven. You know, people thought that because, you know, Elijah didn't die a natural death on earth. He, again, he was taken up by a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. And perhaps the people of Israel misunderstood the great prophecy of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, where God promises, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
That was, as you remember, a promise concerning John the Baptist, Matthew 17. But perhaps the people were mistakenly applying that to Jesus. And still others, as the disciples say, thought that Jesus was the great Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Some of the Jewish people put great stock in a supposed prophecy that was recorded in some of their non-biblical writings, a prophecy that Jeremiah would return to them. In one of these ap apocryphal books, it was said that the Lord promised to raise Isaiah and Jeremiah and send them from the pe to the people. And in another book, a, pro a priest was described as having a vision of Jeremiah coming to minister to the people of God in Jerusalem. Perhaps some of these people who had placed confidence in these non-biblical writings saw how Jesus preached and the coming of judgment on Jerusalem just as uh, Jeremiah of old had done. Perhaps they thus took him to be Jeremiah raised from the dead and sent from God. And still others, according to the disciples, were saying that Jesus was one of the other prophets. Perhaps they thought him to be yet another prophet in a long line of prophets of old. Or perhaps some remembered the promise that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses. The Lord your God will raise him up. You, a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. Now, if, if some thought that Jesus was the great promised prophet, as mere, many clearly suspected, then they would have been right. The Bible teaches us that Jesus truly was this prophet in Acts chapter 3, verse 22 through 26. But even if they trembled before him and said that a great prophet has risen up among us, as they did in Luke 7 and Matthew 21, they would have been wrong if they had thought that he was merely one of the prophets. In fact, if you look over the long list of misconceptions uh, that I heard, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I forgot to put that in there. I'm sorry. But in fact, you look over the long list of misconceptions that the people had about Jesus at that time, these alternatives to the great confession that Peter gave, you'd see that all have one thing in common. I guess I did put it in there. Okay, that one common feature causes the truth affirmed in the great confession of our passage this morning to stand out in stark contrast. All of these alternative assumptions assume that Jesus was just a man. Perhaps they viewed him, as many do today, as one of the truly great men of history, a, great, a man of great spiritual insight, a powerful great teacher and philosopher, but all of those alternative views ultimately see Jesus as only a man and nothing more. They do not see him as Peter here declares him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus asked his disciples here a very pressing question. He says in verse 15, but what about you? And that's really the important question. What about you? Who do you say? that I am. Now, now Jesus asked the disciples what the other people were saying about him. He asked that in order to start them thinking about who he real, truly was. And then it was that Jesus turned to his disciples and asked, well, what about you? In, in fact, in the original lang language, it's emphatic as if to draw the contrast against all the other opinions that were floating around about him. You know, they say this, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And the answer that was given, as uh, that we know from the scriptures, is the correct one. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is the ultimate question that every person has to answer. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ to you? A good teacher? A role model? An ancient historical figure, a myth, an influential religious leader, a quack, a con artist, a misguided fool. Who do you believe about Jesus? When Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? It was Peter, of course, who spoke up. He said in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, I'm paraphrasing here. Bingo! You're exactly right, Peter. You know, that's the question. So that Jesus asked each one of us, who do you say that I am? And it's a question that we all have 
to answer because it determines our destiny, not only for this life, but for eternity as well. The Christian life begins with this confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's part of our repentance because unless you make it in your heart and with your lips, your baptism, you see, is nothing more than a dunking. In the book of Romans, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So today I want to issue an invitation to everyone, anyone listening. If you've never made this declaration of faith in Jesus Christ, make it today. And if you made it in the past, renew it today. And if you've never repented of your sins and you've never given yourself in this confession to be baptized in the Lord, do that. Do that. It's very important. Yeah, affirm in your heart, you know, that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, when Peter made this affirmation, listen to what Jesus said to him again. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be loosed on in heaven. Excuse me. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, Peter's declaration of faith resulted in three things. And the same three things are given to all believers who claim that Jesus Christ is the Lord. But before we look at it, I want you to notice what Jesus said to Peter. This was not revealed to you by man, but, my, but by my Father in heaven. And a proper understanding of Jesus Christ is not something that we have obtained from our own efforts, our own cerebral pursuits. You know, It is something that is revealed to us through seeking God. Now, we can seek God through the Scriptures. We can seek to know Him. And that's probably the best way to seek to know Him. But God reveals this to us. And God revealed to Peter the truth about the nature of Jesus because Peter's heart and his mind were open to the truth. And he was listening to God. You can't approach an examination of the claims of Christ with a closed mind or you'll never fully understand who Jesus really is. Your heart and mind have to be open to the revelation of God. Now, that's because faith, you see, is not something that we manufacture intellectually. It is a gift that we get from God. Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourself, it is the gift of God in Ephesians 2.8. So you can only receive this gift if you're open to receiving it. God can reveal something to you only if you're willing to listen. Peter listened and God gave him a revelation of faith. If you're listening, he will, he will reveal himself to you too. Now, Peter's declaration of faith, again, resulted in three things. That they're available to all believers. Well, let's take a look at them. First of all, <clears throat> first of all when you claim Jesus Christ as Lord he'll use you to build his church he says and I tell you you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it now there's kind of a little play on words going on here the word Peter in the Greek is the masculine form Petros uh, the word rock in the Greek is the feminine Petra, and uh, Jesus is saying, you are, on, you are the rock, you are the Petros, and on this rock, the Petra, I will build my church. Now, the Catholics interpret this statement to mean that Peter was the first pope, and in response, many times, Protestants, I think, try to interpret this verse in a way possibly to discredit the idea that Jesus was ordaining Peter as pope. And they say the rock that Jesus referred to was actually himself. They say that the rock, Jesus, was referred to actually the rock of confessing Christ as Lord. They say the rock, Jesus, referred to was actually the rock of faith. Personally, I think both answers are 
par probably partially wrong. Uh, maybe partially right. Jesus is saying plain, plain and simple, Simon, you're a rock. Good for you for believing this. You're a rock. And upon this rock, the rock that I am the Christ, that is you, I will, and, and that you in your statement, I will build my church. Does that mean Jesus made Peter Pope? No. It means that he made him a Christian. Jesus built his church, you see, on people. When you think of the masculine Petros, what do you think of? Petros, big, masculine. Well, actually, Petros is, is little rock, you know. You'd be wrong if you thought it was a big rock. It's basically pebble, small stone. Petra is big, prudential life insurance rock. You know, you've seen the, the, the emblem for, for prudential. Peter writes, he himself, that is Christ, is the foundation, the cornerstone. Jesus is the rock that, we, that the church is built on. And we are the building blocks that he uses. He used Peter to build his church. He used the other apostles to build his church. And today, he uses us. You are members God, of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Peter wrote that in his first letter that he sent out in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And so really, Jesus is saying, Peter, yeah, yeah, that Peter is the foundation, excuse me, Jesus isn't saying that Peter is the foundation of the church. He's saying that he is the first rock in the building. So there's a partial right in all those things. He's the first rock because he's the first to make the statement, you are the Christ. It might be good to stop at this point and consider what is meant by the thing that Jesus calls the church, you see. Because the Greek word that's translated church is one that you might already be familiar with. It's the Greek word ekklesia, the word from which basically we draw the English word ecclesiastical. You know, so we talk about ecclesiastical forms or ecclesiastical rit rituals or ecclesiastical positions sometimes. It's a common word. That it is a word that's formed by putting, or excuse me, it's not a common word, it's a compound word. A compound word that is formed by putting two words together. The root word is the passive word for uh, uh, of the word kaleo, which means to call or to summon. And the prefix here is the preposition ek, which means out of. So therefore, an ekklesia is an assembly of called out people. And the word ekklesia, used in the New Testament for any kind of official assembly or called out individuals. In Acts chapter 19, verse 39, for example, the city clerk of the ancient city of Ephesus had to rebuke a huge mob that had gathered in protest against the preaching of the gospel, telling them that such inquiries should be made in the lawful ecclesia, that is, the official assembly of individuals called out for that particular purpose. In Acts chapter 7, Verse 38, the vast gathering of the Jewish people who were delivered out of the bondage of Egypt were led by Moses to the promised land were also called the ecclesia in the wilderness. That is the assembly of people that God had called out of bondage unto himself. Now Jesus is the first person to ever use the word ecclesia here to describe the assembly of his redeemed followers. And this morning's verse is the first time in the Bible he uses it. Nowhere in the Bible is the word ekklesia ever used in reference, though, to a building, it, at least in the biblical sense. And the church is not a building, but rather the called-out assembly of redeemed people who might just possibly meet in a building, or they might not meet in a building. These are called out of sin and a lost condition into eternal life in Christ. <clears throat> and I think the best description of this called out assembly of people in the Bible is one that the Apostle Peter used when he wrote to his believing Jewish kinsmen in 1 Peter 2.9. 
You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It is this ecclesia, this assembly of the called out ones who have been redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, who believe and confess from the heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus speaks in this morning's verse, uh, uh, that Jesus speaks of in this morning's verse. It is this church that the Son of God, before he went to the cross, promised to build. And here he promises that it's the one thing on earth, the one institution founded among men that will never pass away. You know, Jesus, today Jesus uh, uh, continues to build his church on people who confess his name. We are the stones that make up the building of his church. In the Bible, <coughs> the church is referred to as the bride of Christ and the body of the Lord. And, and, and oh, I lost my place. I got distracted. I'm sorry. Okay, so it describes the body, the body of Christ. God's plan for eternity is, is that church. All who claim Jesus Christ as Lord will spend eternity in heaven in the presence of Jesus. You are a part of that plan. You are the one of the living stones. He wants to use you to build his church. Now, secondly, <clears throat> he'll use you to do his will. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Other translations say the gates of hell. But the pic picture is of a fortified city here protected by gates. Now in this analogy, <clears throat> who is on the offense? And who is on the defense? Too often times I think we get the idea of this spiritual warfare backward. We think that we're the ones on the de defensive. That we are the ones under attack. That's not how Jesus pictured it here. It's not how he planned it. We are to be on the offensive. Uh, in this battle an army doesn't bring its gates when it attacks an enemy. <clears throat> the army defends its gates. And Jesus is saying here that we, the church, are to be on the offensive. We're to be the proactive force in this world. Now I think we've got a long ways away from that, and I think we see that in, in our society today and what's happening. That's because the church has been quiet, the church has been passive, we've not been proactive. There's a lot of violence that's happening because of that. And I, 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 I'm kind of reluctant to use military analogies right now to describe the work of the church, but I think everyone understands that we're talking about spiritual warfare, not physical warfare. As Paul said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a spiritual battle going on against good uh, uh, and, and evil is taking place in our world and God's will as the church is that the church not shy away from that battle but meet the challenge head on. We're not on the defensive, we are to be on the offensive in a practical sense though. What does that mean? It means that you as a living stone upon which the church is built, your job is to seek out opportunities to do good to act good. Every time, listen, every time you share the love of God with someone who doesn't know Him, you attack the gates of hell. Every time you reach out to someone in need, you attack the gates of hell. Every time you take a bold stand for Jesus Christ, you attack the gates of hell. Throughout history, there have been some who have been described by the church as a harassed, beleaguered remnant trying to hold on long enough for Jesus to come back and rescue them. That is not the picture that Jesus paints of the church. We have to be proactive force in this world, powerful for good, a force that the gates of hell cannot defend itself against. Your job as a follower of the Lord is, as a member of his church, is to do good, to change the world for him. When you make a declaration of faith in Jesus Christ, 
when you proclaim him as your Lord, God will use you to build his church. He'll use you to change the world. And thirdly, he will use you to open doors. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys to the kingdom. Jesus is telling Peter and all believers that we have been made stewards in God's kingdom. We have been given the keys to the kingdom in order to open the door, to unlock it so that others can come in. And we see how that played out in Peter's life. After the death and the resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a simple sermon in Jerusalem and unlocked the door for 3,000 people who came to be saved. In Acts 10 and Acts 15, we see how God used Peter to unlock the door for the Gentiles to come into the church. God used Peter to open the doors of the kingdom for multiplied thousands of people to enter in. Today, the church's job is the same. We are to be opening the doors of God's kingdom so that all who want to know Jesus may enter in. Binding and loosening. Scholars, scholars debate how those phrases can be translated. The verbs, though, were written in the future perfect passive tense. That doesn't mean much to most people in the English language, but it can be translated basically whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, we're doing the binding and the loosing in response to God's will, not our own whim. That's an exa this is another example of our stewardship or, or management responsibility. He's given us the authority and responsibility to do His will, and it's a job that we must take seriously. Now, Bible scholar Craig Bloomberg said it this way, God has delegated His authority to the church, which He leaves to act on its, which he leaves to act on its own initiative to bring as many people as we can into the church of Jesus Christ. See, God wants to use you to build his church, to change the world, to open doors for people, to find their way to him. And as the living stones upon which his church is built, he's given us the keys of the kingdom, the responsibility of taking his message to this lost and dying world. Our orders are not to retreat. Our orders are to charge forward. We are not to be inactive. We are to be proactive. As members of God's church, our job is to seek opportunities to open the doors of the kingdom so that others may come in and find life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the day that we have been, have been given. Thank you, Father, for the message that you've given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we are building blocks of your church and that we are to go out, not be defensive, but be offensive in the fact that we can take your message to others and open the door that they might enter the kingdom of heaven. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. May God bless you and have a great week.